Now, bringing this back to the flagellum, here's a diagram that sort of illustrates the argument. These are multi-part machines, both the mousetrap and the flagellum. When all the parts are together, the machine works. But the individual parts that make it up do not have functions of their own. Why does that mean that something like this is unevolvable? Here's what Behe says. Since natural selection requires a function to select, that's true. An irreducibly complex system like this would have to arise all at once as an integrated unit for natural selection to work. In other words, these individual parts have no function. Natural selection cannot make them. The only thing that could instantaneously put all these together and assemble them would be some sort of supernatural intelligent designer. Now, it sounds like a very powerful argument. Um, and in fact, writings within the scientific community actually tend to kind of like back that up. Here's a guy who actually works on the flagellum, a buddy of mine at Brandeis University named David DeRosier. And DeRosier wrote in a paper 10 years ago, you know, more so than other motors found in the cell, the flagellum actually resembles a machine designed by a human being. They really liked that one. That was good. Um, now, to me, here is the essence of the argument. I want to make this very clear because it's a critical point. The idea is the fully assembled machine has a function and therefore can be favored by natural selection. But the individual parts of the machine, the individual proteins that make it up, have no function. Therefore, natural selection cannot shape them. And therefore, evolution of that complex structure is impossible. Now, how does evolution answer that? Well, the answer is a pretty straightforward way. It answers it the same way Charles Darwin did. And that is to say that these complex machines arise from simpler machines that have different functions. And the components of the machine originate with functions of their own. Now, that's not evidence. That's simply an argument. But here's the cool part. These two different explanations can be put up here side by side. The argument about irreducible complexity and the evolutionary argument. And here's the interesting thing. If the design argument is right, then the individual parts of these machines should be absolutely useless on their own. But if the evolution explanation is right, you know what? These parts should do other jobs. So this is exactly what an experimental scientist wants. We want to be able to take the parts apart, see what they do, and if they can't do anything, they might be right. But if they do have individual functions, then the evolution explanation is likely correct. So what is it? Well, here's what we can do. Let's take that flagellum. This is a diagram showing where some of the proteins are located. And let's take away not one part, not 10. Let's take away 40 of the 50 proteins that are found in one particular kind of flagellum. Now, the cool thing about computers is that experiments like this are really easy to do. So watch closely. There we go. And we've taken away 40 of the 50 parts. And the 10 parts that I have left are the 10 parts that span these proteins here that span one of the biological membranes. Now, if the irreducible complexity argument is right, this little subset should be non-functional. Remember, all these things are non-functional. But it turns out that these parts are not non-functional, if you'll forgive me the double negative. What are those 10 parts? Those 10 parts make up something called the type 3 secretory system. And I can see lots of you in the audience are going, of course, the type, the type 3 secretory system. Why didn't I think of that? Here's what this is. The type 3 secretory system is kind of a molecular syringe. Bacteria use this to hook up to one of our cells and pump proteins into our cells. Why do they do this? Those proteins are called virulence factors, and they kill the cells that they're pumped into. Some of the nastiest bacteria on this planet Ursinia pestis, for example, which causes bubonic plague, is a type 3 secretor. Gets inside your body, pumps your cells full of poison, and kills them. That's why it kills tissue so quickly. Here's what's really cool about this. The 10 proteins that make up the type 3 secretory system are directly homologous to the 10 proteins in the base of the bacterial flagellum. Now, they don't spin. They have nothing to do with motility, but they are perfectly functional. Now, here's the key thing. Remember this claim, any precursor to an irreducibly complex system that is missing a part is by definition non-functional. This precursor is missing not a part, it's missing 40 parts, and it is perfectly functional. What that means, and this is no small matter, is that that statement is wrong. There is simply no other point for it. That statement is not a stray claim. It's the heart and soul of the argument from intelligent design. 
Now, the interesting thing about this, and here is a diagram of the flagellum. Here are the proteins that are found in the type 3 secretory apparatus. Virtually every protein in the flagellum actually is strongly homologous to proteins in another system performing a function that has nothing to do with motility. Some of them are in a family known as the axial proteins. Some of them make up something called the type 2 secretory system. There are signal transduction proteins. There are ion transport proteins. So the notion that none of these proteins have a function until they're all fully assembled turns out to be absolutely positively wrong. It's simply not correct. This is a review article that was published in the journal Nature Microbiology listing these proteins, explaining their homologies, and explaining the other systems that they are part of. So the irony of all of this is that the favorite example of intelligent design, the bacterial flagellum, actually matches the predictions made by evolutionary theory, which is that the parts of this system should have functions of their own. And what this means is that the core argument for intelligent design from biochemical complexity collapses once you look at the scientific literature. Now, the Dover trial, like a lot of arguments about evolution, also involve fossils. And one of the things that you will hear from critics of evolution is that there are no intermediate forms, no transitional forms in the fossil record. A couple of years ago, the National Academy of Sciences tried to put that argument to rest. They said, look, there's so many intermediate forms between fish and amphibians, amphibians and reptiles, reptiles and mammals, even along the primate line, that you often can't tell where the transition occurs from one species to another. That's the very definition of transitional form. But in the Dover trial, we didn't want to argue from quotations. We wanted to show data. And I want to show you something that Kevin Padian, one of our expert witnesses from Berkeley, good things come out of Berkeley too, um, brought into the trial. Um, this is the intelligent design textbook, Pandas and People. And this is part of a page of pandas. And what it shows is a lobe-finned fish from the Devonian period, an ancient history called Eusinopteron, and Ichthyostega, one of the very first amphibians. And they put them side by side, and they simply describe the fossil record as filled with unbridgeable gaps. In other words, evolutionary biologists are so stupid as to believe that somehow this changed into that. And that's an evolutionary explanation for land vertebrates. Um, here is another diagram from the book showing basically the fin of Eusinopteron and the front limb of Ichthyostega. And it in effect says, kids, can you believe they actually think this changed into that? And they write, how many different transitional species were required, were required to bridge this gap? We don't know. But we do know that no such transitional species have ever been recovered. Wow, pretty powerful stuff. Now, what have they actually done? What they've done is on the transition from fish to land vertebrates, They've picked up two examples, Eusinopteron and Ichthyostega, and they say, you know, no transitional species have been recovered. Evolution has an unbridgeable gap. Now, what have they done with respect to what we really know about this transition? The answer is they've ignored most of it. If you actually look at what we know about this transition, they've picked up two species, ignored two transitional forms, Acanthostega and Pantherichthys, and pretended these are the only ones that are there. So in effect, this statement is bogus. The reality is this so-called gap is actually part of a very well understood evolutionary transition in which we can actually trace the development of the tetrapod limb all the way through. But it gets better than that. Let's look very closely at just one part of this transition. The part that starts out with Eusinopteron, then goes to Pander Ichthys and Acanthostega. And in particular, let's ask the critical question. These animals are fish that are very, very amphibian-like, but they're still fish. This is an amphibian that is very fish-like, but it's still an amphibian. Can we find a transitional form at the exact fish-to-amphibian transition that has all the transitional characters we would expect? And I want to show you the story of one of the scientists who found, sought and found this transitional form. 